and I've always been involved in fly fishing down here. My my dad had a fly rod built for me before I could walk. So, I, and I, I was fly fishing before I could cast conventional. All right, guys, welcome to another edition of the Skiff Wander podcast. Today, I am joined by a couple friends of mine, Megan and Travis Glidden. Um, both of them are members with me of a group called Flatsworthy, which we're going to talk about a little bit today. Um, Travis and I got to spend a little bit of time on the water yesterday where I conveniently left my camera at home. So thank you guys for taking the time today um, to sit down with me talk a little bit about Travis's guiding career, how he got started, and then um, since you guys are both highly involved in Flatsworthy, we'll, we'll dive into what it is and, and what what the mission is and kind of what Flatsworthy does. Um, so let's just, yeah, right off the bat, why don't you guys go ahead and talk a little bit about where you grew up and then how you got into the outdoors. Do you want to start? I'll start. (laughs) Um, I grew up um, in Hondo, Mm -hmm. which is west of San Antonio, about 40 miles or so. Um, I would say mainly my outdoor experience has been with my husband. Um, I was definitely grew up, I grew up in a 4-H family, which we'll talk about that here in a little bit. But um, so I showed steers, I did livestock, um, you know, was outside in that aspect. But when it came to like fishing, hunting sort of stuff, my exposure to that has really been with uh, Travis. And as more of a somebody who watches more than actually participates. (laughs) Travis. So I'm from Rockport or grew up here, spent most of my life here and uh, I grew up in Lamar on St. Charles Bay, so I had Goose Island State Park and St. Charles Bay were my backyards, and I've always been involved in fly fishing down here. My my dad had a fly rod built for me before I could walk, so I, and I, I was fly fishing before I could cast conventional which I picked up later, but grew up on a skiff pretty much. Yeah. And I tell you what, like from the, the amount of time that I've spent down here, like in around Rockport and around Corpus, like you had the most amazing place to grow up. You guys, so you grew up mostly fly fishing. Um, have you done a lot of like freshwater or has it mostly been saltwater? Almost all saltwater. Um, I I've been I spent a lot of time in Colorado, uh, especially in the summers. So I've done some cold water, mostly dry fly fishing for trout, but that's pretty much it. Yeah. So which do you prefer? Oh, saltwater all for the sure. Way. <laughs> yeah. There's. I mean, the the cold water stuff is fun, but there's after a. After a while, other than the scenery, yeah, I'm ready to come back to saltwater. Yeah, I've definitely noticed like some of my friends that have grown up fishing cold water, they'll come down and they'll chase redfish with me, and then they're immediately like, "So when can I come back?" <laughs> like, what do you mean? Like, well, I, this is awesome. Like, this is something completely, you know, that they're not used to, and so that's pretty. Um, now, when did you when did you start guiding? Uh, I started originally in 2006, but I was guiding out of Texas. I was a, a big game and fly fishing guide in northern Colorado for about six months a year, and then I'd come back here and work odd jobs and occasionally go to school when I wasn't fishing. <laughs> uh, it, that's always been something that i spent most of my time either in the woods or on the water and that kind of got in the way of actually graduating college or holding down a a real job i mean that's not a you know that's not necessarily a bad thing especially seeing where you're at nowadays yeah and uh like when you were guiding out west when did you start guiding? oh let's start with when did you start guiding here locally uh 
11 or 2011 or 12, I think. Okay. I'd have to look back to get a specific date. Of when you, when yeah. you did that first trip. How much, um, like, so starting with fresh water, cold water, how much correlation, like, how much did that prepare you for guiding in the salt? Fortunately, I I grew up fishing down here in right. saltwater because there's, I mean, other than dealing with clients or, you know, interacting with clients, there's nothing that you can take from no. cold water <laughs> into saltwater. The casting style's different. The rods are different. The lines are different. The rigging's different. I mean, yeah. it's, there's no comparison no it's definitely um fishing with with some of the trout guys i fished with and uh, watching them cast and it's like dude you gotta you gotta get that a little quicker because <laughs> that's one of the things like i've noticed is, is there's a lot of it seems like there's a lot more false casting yeah the, well the other thing is there a lot of the i mean if you fish some of the bigger rivers like the san juan in northern new mexico where you're throwing double nymph rigs which i hate i i well one i can't open my loop up which yeah. they're trying to do intentionally so it doesn't doesn't catch a snag yeah. and you end up with a giant bird's nest and I, I never could get that down how many days like how like so so since you started got like how many days i guess in your career like how many days on the water do you think you spend Oh, overall, I don't, I mean, since I started fly fishing down here, I have no clue uh, when, so to get consistent, even though I've, I had fished down here since I was two, uh, I spent about five years fishing every day I could for myself to get patterning fish down and get consistent where I knew weather patterns, tides, where I was, where the fish wanted to be. Yeah. I didn't want to learn with a client on the boat. No, that's, you know, that's something we talked a little bit on the boat yesterday is, um, as I've been learning this area, I've, I've definitely come to the conclusion that about, it's going to take me at least five years to really feel proficient enough to where I can go out any day, any conditions and, and definitely put a fish in the boat because, um, your tactics have to change as the seasons change, as the water levels change. And I know like last spring we were trying to use the same tactics that we've been using during the summer and it just does not correlate. When did you first move back down here? Um, well, I was living, um, adjacent to the coast and just driving down uh, in, in 40 minutes every time okay. I'd come down here and fish. But right after Harvey, yeah, uh, I got married and... Uh, I got married before Harvey. <laughs> oh. <to> clarify that. <laughs> Okay, oh, no. what year did we? Uh -oh. what, year was Har what year was Harvey? Was it 2015 or 16? 17. 17? Oh, we got married before Harvey. Okay. A year before then. See? Okay, <laughs> well, then, being married, <laughs> it was time for her to move down here and me quit living out of a truck while I was bouncing around the coast. Yeah. And ended up here. And then, uh, is your main, your main focus is fly fishing, but do you do a lot of conventional still? Uh, no, um, almost my guiding is almost all fly fishing. Although sometimes I'll get a, a fly fisherman and as a second client, somebody that either it's their buddy that doesn't fly fish and they'll just stay mid skiff and throw conventional top waters kind of cover the areas of the skiff that the that would be a harder cast for the fly angler i got you that makes sense now that's something i've, I've definitely noticed it, like the other day i went out with someone that wasn't as proficient in fly fishing and i brought some conventional gear and i was like to be honest i really don't even know where to start like i've, I've got some i've got a little bit i've done i mean 
like when I grew up conventional fishing, we were still, we were just doing all live bait. You know, we'd go out into the marsh, catch a bunch of shrimp, catch a bunch of mullet and we'd live bait fish. So we never, this whole idea of sight casting is still, you know, it's fairly new to me. Um, and then sight casting with conventional tackle, like I've got a little bit, <laughs> but I've definitely noticed like there's definitely a whole nother skill set to that aspect. Yeah, and that's something I um, I picked up. I was so I grew up on a an early Texas built skiff, and that the sides were a little too high to effectively pull in a wind. So ended up going to kayaks for a long time from the I'd guess mid nineties to early two thousands, I was predominantly kayak fishing and you'd use conventional tackle to prospect, to find where the fish are, to get out and wade, to fly cast for the redfish. No, that was when I was, when I was first, I don't use them as much. When I was first learning this area, I would spend a lot of time with a spoon fly casting a spoon just because i you know like you were saying you can cover a lot of water yeah and that's kind of like when i talk to when guys ask me like you know what should i start with where where should i start i'm like man don't be afraid to throw a spoon fly on there and kind of get yourself an idea of of what's going on and what's there And, and even now um i'm a little bit better i haven't really done it in a while but you know even some last year when we were going into new areas a lot of times we throw a spoon on just to try to figure out you know where, where they were that day there's various schools of thought yeah, on, I know. on uh <laughs> on whether spoon flies, spoon flies and whether or not that actually is a fly you yeah. like a spoon fly though yeah uh they're they're a good sight casting tool as well and it, there's not a species down here that you can't catch on a spoon fly no i've got i've got a friend of mine who does a lot of um fresh water like lakes and ponds and stuff and he will take an eight weight and he'll tie on one of those like frogs like conventional like he's like i've never found a frog fly that i like so i just use the regular old bass fly <laughs> frogs <laughs> I mean, he's I, like, I'm probably, there's probably people out there that are like, that's not really fly fishing. But in his mind, he's like, I'm using a fly rod. So what's the difference? I know there's lines. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are definitely, definitely some lines there, but. But I know with like spoons, like some of the ones that I've used and some of the ones I've seen, like you look at kind of the craftsman that goes into it and it's like, well, it's hard to be like, you know. Yeah. Well, and there's other fly patterns that are acceptable that use epoxy and mylar. So, right, right. I mean, it's, I, I'm not sure why that specific line is there. No, it's, it's, I think it's interesting because you want to think of it as a, as a straight, like straight hard line in the ground of like, this is fly fishing. This is not. And it's more like a giant curvy line that goes back and forth over, over what is and what isn't for me, at least in my mind, like, if it gets you on the water and it gets you excited, like just, just throw it, just, you know, make sure you're, you're happy, you're, you're enjoying the day and, and that, uh, you know, you're having fun out there. Um, one of the things that, that you mentioned that I, I don't have it on my list of things of topics that I wanted to talk to you about, but you mentioned that you, the skiff that you started out in, and one of the things that I, that I know about you is that you kind of have a nice collection of skiffs back there. It, yeah, I do. I've been, uh, I guess, collecting skiffs for a while. Um, He's a very lucky man. <laughs> the The skiff I started in was a Cuda Craft, which was built locally by a fly fishing guide. And it came from a, a Florida design um, that John Emery did in the early 80s. And when Emery died, this guy brought the molds to Rockport and started making a um, pretty light technical polling skiff, but it was a little better suited to Florida than it, than it was to Texas, which is why I got into kayak fishing. And then in... 2009, I bought my first Waterman and ran that till about 2015. Mm -hmm. And I'd 
and it was a center console tunnel hall uh kind of a florida technical polling skiff that was rigged for texas and it it had some limitations because of the center con the weight of the center console the tunnel um and i ended up in 2013 i got a 16 waterman that was a similar but different polling skiff hull with a 25 tiller and i could go anywhere redfish could swim because of the weight difference between those two boats so i ended up uh selling the tunnel and going with a non-tunnel 18 waterman and then um that was pretty recently i I think about 2018 i found an original uh glade skiff that's a very narrow very light technical polling skiff that is phenomenally easy to pull. <laughs> yeah. It has shorter sides than even than most skiffs that are out there. Yeah. It's 11 inches from the bottom of the boat to the rub rail. Jeez. So you, the wind just, you're not showing a big side of a boat to the wind. No, that's definitely, that's one of the things that, that I like about, about the Sabine that I'm running is that there's not a lot of, you know, uh, freeboard, above the water line right. and so you don't get pushed around too much by the, i think the worst the most i get pushed around is in the back which you know you got the motor sticking up yeah. as a big sail um well and then you're up on the polling yeah. platform so even uh even if you're behind if the boat's behind mangroves or something you're still up there yeah. in the wind so that creates some sail area i just need to get skinnier <laughs> eliminate some of that, that sail area no that was definitely like like when i started you know, looking at what I wanted for a skiff down here, like that was something that I, I luckily was able to get on the water a few times before I got the Sabine. And that was something that I noticed is like a lot of the skiffs that are designed in Florida, you know, they can do well here. And I know plenty of guys that are running Florida skiffs that do really well here, but a lot of the skiffs are designed, are designed for Florida for crossing those big open bays for, for deeper water. And, you know, like, a lot of the skiffs that are designed in Texas, they're designed in for fishing around the areas that we're going into. Yeah, and there's two different now. Um, there's kind of two different styles of boats coming out of Florida. There's the the shorter, uh, more technical protected water boats, and then there's the big like open water tarpon boats. Yeah, and the the high freeboard deep v boats run really well and you could still effectively fish them here but they're not going to pull well yeah yeah because that's one of the things like i tell like i mean you know like you're gonna have wind even on like a calm day eventually that wind's gonna kick up yeah absolutely do you have um off the top of your head do you have any tips for someone that that might be in the market or looking for a skiff whether they're in texas or anywhere um I've I would look at manufacturers that have been around for a while uh so they there's some stability if you have an issue you can still get them warrantied um man it's very specific to where you're yeah. fishing I'm I know a lot of people especially if they're new to an area like running a tunnel skiff i've got I've, i'll never have another one oh, I, can, really? I can do everything i need to do without carrying the displacement loss of a tunnel yeah i have to pull a little bit further sometimes yeah. but i mean it's not that's a bad not thing. a big deal to no. me but you you know, a lot of areas, if you're going to get away with that, you have to know the creeks and what you can do and not do. Yeah. No, and that's one of the things like I kind of tell that I tell people when, when they ask me is like, try to find someone in your area that has what you're looking at and try to see if they'll take you out and, and not only like take you out to show you how it runs in the area, but like get up on that platform 
and pull a little bit so you can see what you're going to be pulling. Because one of the things I've noticed when you when you buy a skiff or when you own the skiff, you spend a lot of time on the back. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, it's it's tough finding somebody to go out with you that's willing to pull. Yeah. Or can do it yeah. successfully. <laughs> and that, that takes a lot of time learning how to effectively pull. Yeah. And that's kind of an art form, kind of yeah. kind of like fly casting. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and then I think even like with, with fly casting, like, you know, it's one thing to be able to fly cast in your driveway or wade fishing, but I think a lot of people miss that. Like, once you get on a skiff, you got to start taking that into account, how that skiff's moving. Yeah, and the wind, skiff movement, wind, line control, so you're not getting the line <laughs> under the boat, off the edge, caught in the trim tabs, or even how fast you got to work the work the work the fly, because you know the boat might be moving towards it, so you got to. Right. It feels like you're stripping too fast, but you're just kind of moving with the boat. Or if the boat's drifting off the fly, you got to move a little bit slower. Oh yeah, there's definitely a lot. Like once you start getting into fishing from a skiff definitely it's it's probably the most complicated thing you can do in fly fishing it's yeah. it's it's a difficult game it's fun oh definitely yeah once you start getting the feel of everything it's i don't know that i'd ever i don't think i'll ever stop no it's no i know you it's won't some, yeah <laughs> it's something you i don't think ever goes away no definitely not um so one of the things that, that we talked about a little bit yesterday is that you keep a log. So we actually took a took a moment yesterday. We got on a flat. We weren't seeing redfish. And you said, hey, um, let's stop and see what the water temperature is. And, you know, that's something that I normally, like, my idea of checking the water temperatures, I'll stick a toe in or stick a foot in and be like, oh, it feels like it should be all right. But um, talk a little bit about, about your log keeping because I think that's something that, I know it's one of the things that like in my mind, I'm like, you really need to start doing this. You need to just take time when you get home and start writing stuff down. So talk a little bit about the pros of doing that and what you're recording. Yeah, I started doing that in 2010 and I wish I'd been doing it longer. I, I, I really wish I had that going back over most of my saltwater career because it's, it's interesting and yeah. it, you can go back to certain areas in previous years and what was going on then, what were the fish doing under specific conditions. And it, it will get you better at patterning fish. Yeah. Uh, so I, every day I'm out, I go to whatever the closest NOAA tide station is and get, tide predictions, actual tide, barometric pressure, wind, water temperature, air temperature, and then I go to another website and moon phase and solar activity and times. And you write all that down? Yeah, sure do. <laughs> do you keep track also of like what flies you're using? Yeah, and then what, what I see, what the fish behavior is, what area I'm in, what flies are working, what flies don't didn't work yeah do you do you keep track at all of like what you're seeing in terms of like bait on the flats like we saw a bunch of crabs or if it's something exceptional yeah yeah and then how has that helped you like from from a guide standpoint well you don't have to you've got a pretty good idea based off the and a lot of times the prediction the predictions for what a day weather wise is supposed to be like or the tide's supposed to be or off sometimes quite a bit but you can get an idea based on the predictions where the fish should be yeah so it you don't have to go to it you know what areas to go to i got you yeah because you fish what what areas like do you predominantly like if somebody wanted to to come fish with you like what areas would where are you predominantly going out of um i that fish rockport to port o'connor okay so i i try not to go say south of wilson's cut yeah. and north of the big jetties in port o'connor i got you 
So that definitely, like, keeping that log probably helps when you have to move around a little bit and you haven't been in an area for a yeah. day or two. and a lot of it is uh, another thing that's that you cannot pattern that does make a huge difference in fish behavior is, has anybody run that flat on a specific right. day or how many boats yeah. have? Which that, I still, like, can't get over. Like, so we went out on a Thursday, and I just know, like, like while we were sitting there in the parking lot, we watched five skiffs come, come out, come off that boat ramp, which I thought was crazy. And that's one of, one of the things I kept wondering was like, we were going to some of those flats a little bit later in the day. I was like, man, I wonder how many times this has been fished just today. Yeah. And skiffs are still a pretty small percentage of the boats yeah. on the water. <laughs> so, yeah. No, but, but I mean, I, I would imagine keeping, keeping that log for so long you you can you can formulate you know plan a through what c d e like there bunch I've, of different... I've got a lot of backup yeah plans. <laughs> <laughs> well Which... one thing using smaller motors i i'm limited on speed right so i can't you know an hour run is 15 miles yeah yeah <laughs> Well, you can't run wide open throttle all the time no. based on bay crossings and stuff like that. But, yeah. you know, you, you can't run 40 miles an hour either. Yeah. But if if I rigged a skiff to run 40 miles an hour, it wouldn't draft as well. So there's, I mean, everything about, especially when you get to the small displacement skiffs, everything about them is going to be a compromise. Yeah. Yeah, on on how far you can go, where you can go, because um, I know like mine mine will run about thirty, and I think I try to keep my radius to about you know an hour, yeah, or so from from any boat ramp. There's a few places where like I just have, you know I'll, I'll suck it up, <laughs> <laughs> which is worth it. Which which some of those places to me like it's totally like you know I know like no one really goes in those areas, so it's worth it. But I also have to, you also definitely have to pick your days when you're going to do something like that. Yeah, because that's, uh, most of most of my skiffs will run, you know, 30 wide open throttle is about it. Yeah. And I'm cruising slightly less than yeah. that, especially in a bay crossing where you've got to time waves because they're small boats. Yeah. No, that's definitely one of the things that, that I started to learn really quickly was how to get that boat from point A to point B safely which you know i've talked to some guys that are getting skiffs and they're like you know how do you get out of this place I'm like you just you gotta you gotta wait or you gotta pick your weather days or you know you just gotta learn the you know where you can go and where you can't go and sometimes that awesome spot that you had your eye on you just gotta look at the weather and say guys we can't get there safely and they'll i mean they will run if you once you get used to driving a skiff, they can run some pretty impressively big water. Yeah, definitely. You just gotta you've got to time it, and I wouldn't do that in the first year or two of no. running a skiff. No, <laughs> no I mean you, you time a wave wrong, and you're in trouble. <laughs> yep, I've definitely uh, early on put put a few few waves through the boat <laughs> which luckily like most of those skiffs are designed to to clean out clear out water really fast i mean i think the biggest issue i have nowadays is you get around some of those bigger boats throwing massive weights yeah. and like you know if there's nowhere to hide i think the the worst story that i have was we had a crew boat come past us and like he was running in a channel. I thought, I mean, I had the right away by, by all measure of the rules of the road. I had the right away, but like he was just determined he was going to get in front of me. And I watched that first boat wait come through. And I was like, told my buddy, I was like, just grab all your camera gear and hold on. And then that one came through and I was like, all right, that's and then, like, as I'm thinking like, all right, that's, Oh no, the second, like the second wake hit and we were ankle deep in the skiff. And I was like, this is it. I just lost my boat. But like within minutes, the whole boat was just cleared out of water yeah. and we were good to go again. Not saying if you get a skiff that you should go try to do this the first time, 
Um, definitely like looking back at that, I wish I had kind of made some moves to get out of the way. Um, I know yesterday we had a, that free, I don't know if you remember that free men coming past us. Yeah. Yeah. I was a little worried there. <laughs> luckily, luckily though, those things don't throw off as big of a weight as, uh, some of the, the big yeah, 40 he, foot boats. He had it planed oh, yeah. out <laughs> he too. Was moving. He, when, unlike when you see some of the the bigger sport fishers that yeah. are running those channels they've got their bow up and they're throwing a massive, massive wake. wake yeah that and uh the tugboats the other thing if you look at wind direction before you come out into a bay yeah I, i've I've eaten a couple waves just poking my nose out into the bay, and it was windier because I was back in the mangroves. It, it was windier than I thought it was. And yeah. I, I had to turn around and run pretty quick. No, and I think, you know, one of the things I think with learning an area that I've started to pick up a little bit on um, is, you know, I've noticed a couple of times like you'll have a wind direction and then. But once you start running in some of those bigger channels and stuff, that's going to turn the wind a little bit to where, you know, all right, this wind's out of the east, but it's I know out of the east in this channel, it's still going to be coming out of the north until I yeah. get through it. And well, that's just all learning. Yeah, and a lot of times you'll get on a certain wind direction in a tight channel, it'll actually build the waves yeah. bigger than yeah. they are. <laughs> Definitely. The last, the last thing we're gonna, because I, I do want to pick y'all's brains about Flatsworthy. Um, you got any tips for someone that might be thinking about starting a guiding career? I think the biggest thing would be try and get into the area that you're thinking about guiding in. Spend a couple of years there. Get to know the fishery. Get to know the guides. Um. A lot of the <laughs> one of the, trying one of, to figure out a way to say this. One of the things that that I've noticed um, with getting the chance to fish with a bunch of different guides is it's a lot more than you know it's it's a lot more to it than just um, knowing how to catch fish. And knowing where fish are, you know, I think, <laughs> I think, <laughs> I think, um, there's a, there's a certain personality type that I think you have to have to really be able to take somebody out and then, you know, keep a positive mentality on the boat. Um, and then also I think there's a huge coaching aspect that you've got to be really good at, which you know, I don't know if you can speak yeah. to that or a little bit, but that's something that I've noticed. The, the guys that I've gotten a chance to fish with, like, they're really good about, you know, you blow a cast and they're like, hey, there's going to be another one. Yeah. It's all right. And then if, you know, the other thing too is like, if you're going out there and, and you're messing up on cast, like they, they can quickly and easily and reinstill that confidence in you and then kind of help you with whatever issues you're having. Yeah, definitely. And I, that's a, he as much a part of it is fishing yeah you got anything else no i don't think so <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well i think the big thing for you is knowing your waters and being good at it yeah being consistent before you go and say i'm going to take somebody out <laughs> yeah that's kind of what i was getting yeah. at in yeah. the first part of that and mm -hmm. just um not having the the local guides that have been there for years have no clue who you are yeah yeah and, and you show up and you're a guide no i've definitely I've, I've noticed some of that too of like you know get it get into the area get to know everybody get to and, and make sure like if you're getting into an area that you want to guide in like be super respectful um of not just the people that are there but of also of you know, the area that you're fishing, make sure you're taking care of it, make sure you're, you know, taking care of the fit, not just the fish, but you know, everything out there. Um, because especially if you're going to get in a guiding, like, I mean, that's your livelihood and taking care of that from the ground up is I think super important. It is. I think, I think it helps also if you're trying to build a reputation 
within a community, like, you know, guys see that, you know, all right, this person actually cares. They're actually, you know, they're running flat, you know, running around flats. They're not running across flats. They're, you know, they're, they're teaching their clients the right way. They're making sure that their clients know what kind of issues are going on so that they can get some more help in any kind of area. I think that goes a long way with, with trying to establish oh, yourself. Yeah. I'm, it does. Absolutely. Yeah. Which speaking of taking care, care of an area, you guys are both part, or I guess all three of us are part of a group <laughs> called Flatsworthy. Um, which I'm going to let you guys speak a little bit about what Flatsworthy is, if you guys want to. I don't know whichever, whoever wants to take the... Travis has the best pitch on this one. <laughs> <laughs> well, it started out as, uh, and we we branched out from this. So it started as a group that was just general boating etiquette on the flats. If um, Even if you've done um, the boater safety course from Texas Parks and Wildlife or a captain's license, that's all navigation in boating lanes. It doesn't talk about operating a vessel outside of that at all that I can remember. Mm -hmm. And we're getting a lot of new boaters in the area and even boaters that have been down here for a while that just don't realize how they're affecting other anglers by shortcutting a flat or running a shoreline. That's one of the big complaints in this area is burning shorelines to find fish or to stay out of a chop. Yeah. No, and and I mean, definitely like, there, there aren't a lot of resources out there. Like if, you know, there's a lot of resources for learning how to, you know, like handle yourself on the water. But when you get into like the fishing aspect or especially down here, like, cause like I grew up in South Carolina where, um, you know, you got a five, six foot tidal range. So if you're at high tide where you can go is a lot more open um, the channels typically are, are 10 feet, so you can easily stay in a channel, whereas you come here, and I think the average depth is a foot and a half. And if you don't understand how to respect getting onto those areas or off those areas or you come from somewhere else, you might think, like, oh, you can run through this creek, and you don't realize, like, that creek is also a natural causeway for any fish getting into those back areas and it's way better for you to stop at before you get into the creek and pull through it as you get into the back areas and there there really isn't resources that teach you that a lot of a lot of it's kind of handed down father to son or or father to daughter or or mom to kids well and specifically the creeks are i mean unless they're way in the back they're understood boat lanes so yeah. if you're fishing one, somebody's going to come by. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I I don't know that that affects, especially since a lot of those creeks are deep. I don't think it has a huge effect on the fish in them yeah. long term. Running a shallow flat will alter fish behavior, at least for the rest of the day. Yeah. So, so flats where they was started as this kind of etiquette project. Yeah. Uh, and how's just it, how's don't, it grown? Uh, just, you know, the other than just the basics that we just discussed, it's also don't cut off people's drifts, watch where the other boats are. Just try and remember that you're not the only person out there, yeah. regardless of craft type. I, I know we've been talking about polling skiffs, but it's not just a polling skiff group it's kayakers airboaters um conventional flats boats wade fishing guys it's it's trying to include everybody yeah no and i think that's that's one of the things that i'll see is i think a lot of people don't quite understand how different boater groups or different boat types like how they're using specific areas like I've yeah. noticed like, like pulling, like pulling my skiff. Like if I see somebody that's wade fishing, I'll try to figure out what direction they are so that I don't get in their way. Um, I know like when I see other polling skiffs, I honestly, I try to just find a different place to go. Cause you don't, a lot of times with polling skiffs, like you don't know, 
you know, all right, maybe he's in, you know, one back lake, but is he going to come into this lake that I was looking at next? And I, like a lot of times for me, at least I'm like, I don't know. And I don't want to be around to find out and because if I don't want him to have to come through here because I've, and now I fished this and now he has to try to figure out how to get back. And so I, like for me, at least I, I, I try to, I try to avoid everybody. <laughs> Yeah, so do I, and it, a lot of that is by avoiding other boats, you find happier fish. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, uh, as you got, did you guys, were you, are you guys both, were you both part of like the original when Flats where they first started? Uh, I came in shortly after that. I wasn't at the original meeting, but um, within a couple months. Yeah. I, maybe a year. Yeah, I came around, I guess it was after I started working down here. I'm an educator by trade. And so uh, I kept listening how they were educating yeah. humans. And I, I educate youth. And so my thing was, you can teach adults all day. It's really hard to change adult behavior. But you can change adult behavior by changing youth behavior. Because right. they're going to grow up to be adults. And have you ever had a kid guilt you into doing something? All the time. And so you can maybe guilt some dads by educating youth as well or moms and, you know, for good practice, good behavior. And so I really, I was listening to what they were doing for, what, two, three years? The, well, the other thing mm -hmm. is we were, we, well, I got volunteered whether I liked it or not <laughs> to uh, be involved in the 4-H uh, youth sport fishing program and that's how kind of the uh, she came into Flatsworthy mm -hmm. was through that yeah was, ed educate the youth and you'll you'll probably you'll go farther yeah and so that's uh, it was about what 2019 I guess and this yeah it's about summer of 2019 I sat down um, with you and Chuck and Chuck's wife and I was we had we had dinner it was great and I was like I have an idea I have a captured audience of youth that are great youth that are, aren't going to stress you out like, you know, maybe, you know, hundreds of kids. And they'll learn how to fish and they'll learn what you're teaching them. They will be your best audience because this is what 4-H teaches. 4-H teaches real skills. They, you know, real world type skills that will last them a lifetime. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, I hooked him in because I think what he does is really cool. <laughs> and I knew it would capture our kids, you know, attention. And through that youth outreach, we've, um, part Aransas County, cause I'm a county agent in Aransas County. Um, we partner with Calhoun County. They have a Marine agent, RJ Shelley. They have a 4-H agent, Emily, um, DeForest. And we've partnered on creating, you know, where our kids sport fish together, or we have activities where we'll go back and forth. But then we had a really cool, um, it, our, last year was our first year. We did a coastal bend 4-H sport fishing day. And Flatsworthy sponsored it, paid for the entire thing. And it was, guides came out. We had Travis, we had Captain Chuck, we had um, Captain Dean Thomas, and um, we had Flatsworthy volunteers. And they all came to teach the kids, you know, something about sport fishing, whether they had some experience or no experience. And they fished, they kayaked, they, um, Texas Parks and Wildlife was there and taught them about careers and sun safety. I mean, it was the gamut and it was super cool. We've also done with, um, uh, with Dean, we've had, um, who's in Flatsworthy mm -hmm. uh, and he's done a youth kayaking day. Mm -hmm. We've had, um, uh, Stacy Lynn come down and teach, uh, fly casting to anybody that was interested. Mm -hmm. We've taught them just the, the basics from, just generally like spin fishing with bait, throwing a cast net up through fly fishing and done some boater education is something RJ's doing. Mm -hmm. RJ does a really cool boater ed course. I think that's how he's doing one in Calhoun County at the end of this month. And, um, but it's one of those things that, you know, everything always has that underlying thing of, you know, taking care of our environment because, you know, we want to keep doing this. And yeah. that's, that's what's neat about it is you have these these guides that want to teach these kids. And so these kids are getting this most amazing education. For me, looking at, at that perspective, they may not realize it, but 
it's pretty cool. I mean, we even have like little Flatsworthy youth ambassadors in Calhoun yep. County. Yep. Um, they're, they're doing a great job of being good representatives for us. And uh, uh, Flatsworthy did a couple scholarships for the 4-H kids. Yeah. And so it's been it's been fun. And, you know, learning we're working on growing that mm -hmm. and building that outreach. We're doing our little sport fishing day again this summer and making it bigger. We're opening it up not just to the five counties and that are along the coast right here in our district, but to our entire district, which is 18 counties. Mm -hmm. And so that reaches from New Oasis all the way to Washington County near um near College Station. And so it's a, a large area where kids can come down to the coast and do some fishing with guides and, you know, get on a kayak. They've never been on a kayak before. It's kind of cool. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. No, that's, man, I, I tell you what, every time I like hear about those things, I'm always at work. Because like, I'm always like, oh, dude, I, I would love to come and do that. And it's like, oh, I'll be at work. We'll Which, set up a day when you're not at work. <laughs> I make Travis do sport fishing meetings. Those come up in the spring. <laughs> they, you know, sometimes it's bait fishing. Sometimes it's learning how to tie a knot. Yeah. No, and, I, and you know, one of the things that, that uh, you were talking about was a little bit was with the boater education. And it's something that I think everyone should do. It doesn't matter, you know, if you... Like if you're if you're just getting into boating, you should take a boater education course. It doesn't matter how old you are, and I I would push it so far as to say like if you have the time and the means, you should look at getting at what it takes to take the classes and get a six pack captain's license. Mm -hmm. um, my father, we started offshore fishing when I was 13, and one of the things my dad did is he went out and got a six pack license, not because he ever intended to guide or anything, but he wanted that skill set, that navigational skill set, how to, and then also like they taught, teach a lot of safety stuff in there. Um, and I kind of look at that moment when he got that as what threw me on this whole path, career path that I'm on. Cause I was in I think seventh grade and he made me sit down there with him and learn all of it with him. So <laughs> when I went to college, it was, it was kind of simple. Cause it was like, all right, I've known how to do dead reckoning since I was 13 years old, so I'm just going to keep learning that stuff. But I think, you know, those skills um, at a young age are really important. And then I think, you know, what everything that Flatsworth is doing with not, with taking it to the next step mm -hmm. of how to be an etiquette. Uh, is that the right way to put that? How to uh, how to approach it? With, with, yeah, how to be a good steward mm -hmm. on on the water mm -hmm. is definitely a good step. And I know, like the first time I sat down with with Chuck Neiser, who's the president of Flatsworthy, and just listened to him talk about it. Like he's so passionate mm -hmm. about everything that Flatsworthy does, and about the whole entire environment out here, and making sure that everyone's using it the right way. And, um, that it's going to just get better, which mm -hmm. is something that, that I kind of hold dear personally is, you know, I see what is out there on the flats and I want one day to, you know, my kids to be able to see it mm -hmm. the same way, if not better. Mm -hmm. And then even my grandkids, I hope by the time I have grandkids that, you know, I'm looking, I'm going like, man, you guys don't know how good you have it. Mm -hmm. Like back and back when I was, you know, first fishing down here, like it was worse. <laughs> <laughs> Leave it better than you found it, right? Definitely, definitely. Which you know, some of the, you know, some of the stuff that we've run into that kind of um, expanded Flatsworthy from j purely um, flats etiquette into kind of what it is now, where we partnered with CCA on the oyster yep. issue that you just did a podcast about and we've worked with um, some of the other agencies in the area uh, after especially after Harvey is you could see how much that storm changed especially San Jose Island mm -hmm. and how it breached a lot of those back lakes which if those go tidal that wipes out that area yeah. and uh some 
of the damage that we noticed there because just because it was accelerated so much by the storm, but a lot of that was caused by um, boats. Run, running up in there. Yeah, you can change an entire marsh system just by shortcutting a creek. Yeah. Because eventually it goes tidal. Yeah. Yeah, especially like... You lose the grass, then the shoreline comes down, and then it it either silts in the natural creek and becomes tidal, or you can blow a hole through between a lake and the bay. Going off of that, like how much, you know, since, since you've lived down here your entire life, how much have you seen it change? A lot of the stuff is, I mean, until you get something catastrophic. Yeah. Uh, a lot of it's a subtle change. But the oyster harvest just in two years is gone catastrophic. Yeah. And that's that's something that I think everybody noticed in a short amount of time and are, and are working to correct that. Uh, a lot of the stuff is, well, uh, Harvey was another thing that, like, the, the shorelines have, have and will always change a little bit. Right. But when you start getting those massive events, you'll see shorelines change very fast. Yeah. And then the freeze was a huge change. I've never, I've never seen all of the mangroves dead like that. I mean, you'd be in an area that was just looking out into a sea of green and it's all brown. Yeah, Yeah, it's still like... That was a massive, just sudden change. No, I still have like some of my favorite pictures are being out there um, when they're all in bloom. And this last summer, it hurt to like, you're pulling around and you feel like you should be in, you know, your normal winter clothes because it still looks, everything's dead. But we saw we saw some. They're starting to come back a little yep. bit. I think a few more years we will be back in green pastures. Yeah, they're. I I don't think. I didn't see anywhere that that doesn't have some mangrove coming back. Yeah. So it it apparently didn't affect the root system. But if you look at how old some of those trees, I mean, some of those mangroves were huge. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, and, and that, that's one of the things that, um, like, when I talked to Chuck that he kind of Im- implanted in my mind was, you know, these natural disasters, if you're going to call them that, they're going to happen. Oh, and yeah. so the big thing that Flatsworthy is trying to do is limit the person impact mm-hmm. on these areas so that when these natural disasters do happen, the, the areas can bounce back a lot quicker well and there's a i mean there's a reason and they will change but there's a reason that it's formed the way it's formed yeah and the the uh shoal grasses and the mangroves are part of holding those shorelines yeah. together so when we get a a massive storm which is going to happen sooner or later uh it won't be as catastrophic as it could be yeah no and that's something like I mean, that even ties into the oyster reefs, keeping the yeah. oyster reefs in the bay is, you know, they they help keep some of that swell and storm surge from really impacting the, the main, the, the coastline, the main coastline right. as badly, um, which it sounds like we're, uh, we're, it sounds like with the oysters, we're, we're definitely moving in the right direction. And I'll tell you, anyone that's following along, you know, I know I post a bunch about it, but you guys got to realize it's not going to be over in a year. It's a long fight. And that was one of the things that like Shane, when I talked to him, he was like, just be ready. Cause this isn't going to, this isn't something that's going to go away in a year. This is going to be a long-term project for all of us. And so if you're paying attention to that, just realize that we need your support now and we're going to keep needing it for, for time to come. Well, yeah, it's a, I mean, it's going to be a, long term I mean even if the harvest happened to change overnight yeah. to go to farming it's still those reefs took hundreds or thousands yeah. of years to build to where they were yeah I, I so I asked Shane about that and um, 
He said that they've got one in Sabine Lake that was basically decimated and they left they've left it alone for I think fifty years. And I'm hopefully I'm not butchering this and if I if I am, I'm sorry, Shane. <laughs> <laughs> they've left it alone for like the last fifty years and it's only grown like five feet. That's crazy. Which, I mean, that just goes to show you, like, I mean, listening to the, some of the stuff that I've read and learned and listened, like, these reefs are losing, like, a foot a year, foot, two foot in places with, with the way the oyster harvest is currently going. I mean, so you're talking, you know, 10, 20, 30 it's years a, just to get back to where it was today. And that's not even talking about all, how how much it's been decimated in the last, God, yeah, how long I, I, been um, and oysters. <laughs> Well, I mean, there there's a bunch of areas around here that you used to have to know where you were yeah. going to get through it, and now I'm just go straight across. Jeez. Well, hopefully, I think we're all moving in the right direction. I definitely would say anybody that's listening to this, check out Flatsworthy, um, especially if you're new to boating and you want to learn a little bit better about how to be a steward on the water how to respect not only the environment but also your fellow anglers you guys should definitely check out flatsworthy um i gotta get chuck on the show it's coming i know (laughs) yeah you just gotta nail him down i know it's it's hard um and i'm gonna leave a link down below so that you guys can have a quick link over to check out their website and and do a little bit more research and hopefully you guys will join in with the rest of us. And Flatsworthy has a free student membership. As long as you're in school, you can join for free. There you go. So mm-hmm. all you college kids, mm-hmm. join. Yep. Um, all right, last question. This is my Skiff Wandering podcast, Ask Everyone Question. Um, so <clears throat> one, of the, one of the things with, with this channel and, and everything that I like to do is the whole wandering aspect, the whole going on adventures, going to, to cool new places and getting, getting to check them out and, and learn new fisheries and meet new people. Um, and so this is either both of you guys feel free to answer. Definitely. Um, if you go anywhere in the world to go fishing, where would you go? Um, well, that's a good question. There's, um, I've been to the, keys mm-hmm. uh, and i enjoyed fishing and just hanging out in the sugarloaf key west area yeah um and the fishing's so good around texas and i like redfish <laughs> so much i don't really feel the need to do destination trips yeah my dad did a couple trips years ago to turn of island in belize mm-hmm. that that would be one thing that I can't do in Texas that I would like to is get a permit on a fly rod. Yeah. Dude, Belize is so high on my list. Mm-hmm. We, we, uh, I tried to make it happen this summer. I don't think it's going to happen. I'm hoping for me, at least I'm hoping that by the end of the year I can make step, step foot in Belize. But yeah, I think Belize is definitely super high. Megan. Mm-hmm. Hey, as long as he's taking me with him, I'm good to go. <laughs> You're ready to go. I just need a beach and a tiki drink or something, and I'm fine. I can, we're, I'll we're, sit on the pointy end of the skiff if I need to. But. We're, we're gonna we're gonna work on fly casting <laughs> lessons for you. Yeah. That's next. The only thing I've managed to catch on fly is him. So literally. <laughs> but no. Um, if you, if you guys are interested in coming down to the Texas coast, you want to book a day, um, check out Travis. He's on Instagram at Sightcast Safari, and then your website is the same thing, sightcastsafari.com. Um, like he said earlier, Rockport to Port O'Connor. Hit him up, and I'm going to leave links down below to, to everything so they can, everybody can quickly and easily find you. Um And then lastly, if you guys haven't already, if you're on Google, Spotify, please leave a review. Helps me out a lot. And then if you're on YouTube, hit like, hit subscribe, and share this stuff with your friends, please. Thank you guys for having me. Thank you. Yeah, it was fun. Also, um, all the information for Flatsworthy is on flatsworthy.com as well as how to become a member if you're interested. Yep, and I'm going to leave links down below for all that stuff as well. I figured it'd be in there. Yeah, (laughs) definitely it's going to be in there. I enjoyed it. Yeah, Yeah, thank thank you guys.
Thank you. It.